Hi folks, welcome to Electrogravity video series. Electrogravity is the third paper of the Ethereal Mechanics series and this video is an addendum to the gravity video released last week. And in this addendum, we're going to talk about the force of gravity. I know there's people out there who say gravity is not a force. Well, I'm going to prove to you that they're all wrong. This also includes recent updates and breakthroughs and Patreon asked questions. So in this video, we're going to talk about that gravity is indeed a force. And we're going to show you how everybody else, including relativity, are wrong using their own models. Okay, then we're going to talk about the field of gravity and the force of gravity. And why does matter feed in a strange manner? This was a question brought up by a Patreon member. And then we're going to talk about announcements, results of the Bro Life and Rabbit Hole research, and where we have found out we can unpack the Planck constant and the fine structure constant, just like we're going to do for the G constant in this video. We're going to talk about the FTL breakthrough we had going down the Bro Life and Rabbit Hole. We'll explain what the Bro Life and Rabbit Hole is. And then we're going to talk about the Ethereal Mechanics Standard Model update. So, if you go on to YouTube, uh, YouTube and you search that for gravity is not a force, these are the first videos that I got up. And everybody is saying gravity is not a force. Gravity is not a force. Gravity is not a force. Is gravity a force? Why gravity is not a force? Okay, and this blows my mind. Now, let's take a look at what they're saying. Why they're saying the gravity for and I took this screenshot from Veritasium and this is in that first video on the top of the list you saw before and at the 22 minute and 20 second mark he shows a person falling from a building and he shows a person in a spaceship and he says because this person does not feel gravity neither does this person feel gravity and there's certainly no forces acting on him that means that falling is not a gravitational field which means man falling from roof is not a gravitational field so if you want to learn more about this nonsense you can go back and watch Derek's video but let me show you why this does not make any sense because let's go look at relativity because this is all based supposedly on relativity and if you go to relativity on Wikipedia here is the model for general relativity and my god it's a force model and look at this first term here this first term here is Newton's gravity force force of gravity? So you got Newton's law with a big old honking constant of relation g. I'm sorry, this is a force model. You can't sit there and say it's not a force when they're using Newton's force model in general relativity. You say, well, what about the other terms? Well, this term is an angular momentum term. We're not talking about angular momentum right now. We can ignore this. And then you have this other term here, which they call the the relativistic effect and well okay this is a uh, inverse r to the fourth divided by c squared this term is so tiny 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 it can in no way in no way possible can this mitigate this force in order to cause force cessation that's what we're calling it that when you're falling yes you're going to have force cessation but that doesn't mean there's no force it just means the force is seceding and we're going to show how ethereal mechanics explains for cessation okay and the other problem with this is the sign is backwards if you're going to mitigate force or have force cessation then this term would have to be positive this term is negative okay so gravity according to the general relativity equations is force now some relativistic grease monkey is going to say well it's a, 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 a gravitational potential energy and and real space-time fabric and all this i'm sorry if you've got newton's gravity model embedded in general relativity i'm sorry if it walks like a force and it quacks like a force it's a force i don't care how much lipstick you put on it you got newton's force model and they even call it right here newton's force model of gravity right there so don't give me any of this nonsense that it's somehow something different. It's not. This is a force model. Doesn't matter how, what you call it. At the end, you're using the constant G, and the constant G was developed for a force model. So I don't want to hear any of your nancy pansy things. It's a force model. And we get, now we got three strikes and you're out. Well, actually, there's a lot more for relativity. Because remember what we talked about in the previous videos. Special relativity, Einstein said the medium doesn't matter. But then when he introduced general relativity, he introduces a medium called the fabric of space-time. He contradicts himself all the time. 
He says gravity and inertia are equivalent, but he can't explain inertia. He says gravity is not a force, but general relativity is a force model. We just saw that. He says there's force cessation must occur on a free-falling body, but general relativity has no such mechanism in their model. And I'm going to show you in a much later video that general relativity predicts an over-unity condition. We're not going to talk about it now. I'm just, I'm just baiting you for the future. We're going to show you something amazing that says the universe shouldn't even be here if these physicists did their homework right on general relativity. And so, so you ask your question, well, how can all these smart people be taken by this fraudster? I mean, every turn of the event that I look at this clown, he is the worst thing to have ever happened to physics. He is the absolute worst thing. I mean, I guess I could say in general the worst thing to happen to physics is physicists, but he is far and beyond the absolute worst thing to happen to physics. And I think Mark Twain said it the best. It's far easier to fool people than to convince them that they've been fooled. Oh, my little laser is on his, burning his chin there. Okay, and also don't let schooling interfere with your education because I experienced having to overcome a lot of the bad things that they teach you in college. Okay, there's certain good things, but there's also this junk that they give you that stands in the way of proper logical thinking. And this is some of the best advice right here. Don't let schooling interfere with your education, or at the very least, don't let the stuff you learned in school dominate the rest of your life because you're going to find most of the crap you learn in college is nonsense. Okay, so next, now we're going to show you theoral mechanics revol resolves the cessation of force for gravity. After that, we're going to show some other updates, answer some Patreon questions, and we're going to show how the Patreon stuff actually up dovetails with the above discussion about the cessation of force. So when we talk about gravity and ethereal mechanics, like we've said, we have, to se we have to separate the field and the force of gravity. The field of gravity is one thing. The force of gravity is a completely different thing. The field of gravity, if you've watched the previous videos, you realize that matter has to feed on ether to exist. Matter is not a perpetual motion machine. It must consume fuel to exist, and ether is the fuel. And ether that I've stated many times in the past stores energy in the form of joules per unit volume. And what we're using for volumes, we're using cubic meters, okay? And with all the math that I've shown you in the past here, and we're gonna we're gonna we're going to show you why this has to be true, but the math works out to that matter consumes ether in terms of volume per second squared. Now that has thrown some of my Patreon folks off, and that's good. I'm glad they're thinking. They're like, well, if energy per unit volume, then shouldn't matter consume in terms of volume per second? That would be power. Yes, that's what one would think. But every time I did the math, it came out to volume per square second. And for the longest time, this befuddled me until I came up with a very good explanation we're going to have in this video is why this must be. But we can see what I forgot to do in the previous videos is show you that G, this is shown in blue, which means it is in the legacy form that we see everywhere. This is in volume per square second per kilogram. So G is no longer an arbitrary constant of relation. It is actually your feeding constant for matter. And it shows you per kilogram how much volume per square second that a kilogram of matter must eat to survive. That's what this constant means. It's no longer arbitrary. And according to the 24th rule of acquisition, if you know what you're doing, then nothing should be arbitrary. Okay, and that's why we are eliminating all of the arbitrary constants of relation in ethereal mechanics because these arbitrary constants of relation hide underlying mechanisms of nature. And if you break them out and understand what they truly mean, they tell you exactly what's going on, just like G does. So, going back to the field of gravity. Because matter consumes ether, we take matter and multiply it by the consumption, and that gives you the volume per square second of consumption of ether. And then if you want to find the influx velocity of the ether at any given distance, you take this and divide by d. This is essentially the small scale gravity model 
for ethereal mechanics, also known as the ethereal acceleration model. This is the small scale. We'll talk about small scale and large scale later. We also have a version in natural units where we don't have any of the blue gunk obscuring stuff. This comes out with the same answer. Because in this term here, these two blue terms cancel each other, leaving us natural units, which is uh, acceleration in meters per second squared. So now we've talked. Now we're going to talk about the force of gravity. We've talked about the field of gravity. Now let's talk about the force of gravity. The force of gravity is the inertial force model. In other words, electromagnetic magnetic induction. So you have model of matter which is made up of charges. And when those charges accelerate relative to the medium, they generate fields which retards their ability to accelerate relative to the medium. And that is inertia. And it's also the force of gravity because when ether is accelerating toward a planet, if you are caught in that accelerating field, you are going to experience a force based on inertia. Now the difference is, if you are not moving relative to the ether, you will have no inertial force generated. So if you move with the ether, <clears throat> there is no force. That's the force cessation issue. And we can generalize this as follows. This is F equals inertia times acceleration. This is F equals MA. This is in natural units. It says the inertial force on a target, inertial force on a target, is equal to the inertia of the target. This used to be what we call mass times the acceleration of the ether minus the acceleration of the target. So if the target and the ether are accelerating together, there is no force. This is your force cessation technique or mechanism right here. Okay, so we go back to uh, Veritasium video. So when this guy is falling, he's falling at accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared. Guess what? The ether is falling, accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared too. Because they're accelerating at the same rate, the inertial force on him goes away. Force, because this is equal to this, this is equal to zero. Same thing, when he's in the spaceship, and the T means he's the target, so the inertial force on the target is equal to the inertia of the target, subtracting the difference between the ethereal acceleration and the target acceleration. Okay, because he and the ether are moving together, this comes out to zero. I put zero here. That may not necessarily be the case in all cases. But, I mean, in this particular situation, that's what it should be according to the thought experiment. Okay, and that is how you get force cessation. It's because the ether motion is the force of gravity and your acceleration relative to the, to the ether is both the force of gravity and the force of inertia. The force of gravity and the force of inertia are the same thing. The field of gravity is something different all the way entirely. And that's why we had to separate force from field. We call that the force field paradigm in the paper. Okay, but now what we can do is we can take the gravity, substitute the gravity field model into the inertial force model to combine them together. And here you go. This is your force of gravity on the target is equal to what looks like your Newton model minus the acceleration of the target. Okay, and this is also part of your force transvariance that we talked about in the paper. That if you outrun your forcing function, nothing can couple to you. This is very similar to that concept. Okay, again, this is the small scale model. In the cosmology paper, we introduce the large scale model that account for tiny effects that become significant at very long distances, large time scales, and under intense gravitational pressure. This is the small scale model. It's good enough for now, but when we get to the cosmology paper, we're going to expand on this to show you the things that happen in galaxies and in universes and in black holes. We're going to do the whole number there. We're going to show you stellar aberration. We're going to show you the precession of Mercury without overunity. We're going to show how galaxies form, the different life cycle of galaxies. And we're going to show you that you can get the proper motion of the stars and galaxies without dark matter. Okay? It's all coming. But now, what I'm going to answer here is, this is one of my Patreon members had a question, why is ethereal consumption for matter vol volume per square second? You would think, hey, it should be volume 
per second because that would be power in the inertial in in the essence of the definition of ether being a store of energy okay and this is the update to the paper this part was incomplete up until version 1.1 and i'm going to show you this in the diagram form on the next pages so we go back to our drone analogy this drone analogy has been a windfall of wonderful ideas dealing with all of this stuff okay and what we have for our drone is we put the drone under the load of a cannonball and under the load of the cannonball the drone has to burn fuel at a constant rate to keep the cannonball at a stationary height above the ground okay and because of that the energy of that cannonball the potential energy of that cannonball is being maintained constantly so this is a constant energy of the cannonball that is being maintained by a constant rate of fuel burning this dv dt this is volume per second and f means some kind of function so you take the volume per second of fuel multiply by some function and you come up with the force that is being applied to the cannonball in this case here we're showing that one step further that the energy is a function of a force and the force is a function of consumption these two f's are not necessarily the same f okay but the interesting part here is that no work is being done on the cannonball now work is kind of a strange thing work is really a change in energy but we electrical engineers we don't really use work that much work is kind of ambiguous we engineers really like the concept of power. Power is the time derivative of energy. And so if we take a time derivative of all these terms, this works out to here. And so the power being applied to the cannonball, okay, requires the drone to burn fuel at a rate of the volume per square second. Okay, and all machines, from matter to drones, all machines work on power 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 is what powers everything that's why they call it power and this is what we're powering matter with is the reason why it the fuel being consumed by the drone has to be volume per square second now you're saying well hold on, this doesn't make any sense well let me show you the next part oh okay power is proportional to volume per second square i forgot that point so another new concept added to the paper in the version 1.1 is called the first and second systems. I have this blocked out because this shows an interesting thing that only people that get the paper will see when the paper is released. Paper will be released this weekend sometime. So there's a new concept called the first and second system. We have, let's go back to the drone analogy. You have the drone and for the drone to power itself, it's going to burn fuel in terms of volume per second. That's how the drone gets its power. Okay, but the difference here is the drone is transferring power to a second system, the cannonball. And in order for the drone to pass power to a second system, okay, it's got to burn fuel at volume per second squared. That's because we have to give power to this but we have to send power and there's where you get your other time constant in there that's where you get your other time in the denominator and that's why because we're passing power to a second system that requires us to burn fuel at a, at a much different rate than just for the first system so the second system power requires a higher burn rate and if we added a third system on the end well in order to get power to this third system the drone is going to have to burn fuel at it in terms of meters cubed per second cubed. And once I got to this, this made perfect sense. But the most beautiful thing of this, it says, it says because matter feeds at volume per square second, that matter is the second system. So what is the first system? And those are the ideas I blanked out on that page before. And when the paper is made public this weekend, you will be able to see uh, what's down there. I'm not going to speculate now. There's so many interesting things it could be. It, it's like opening up a door of all new interesting things. It's really an amazing rabbit hole that has opened there. So here's some announcement. This The, the Bro Life in Rabbit Hole, what that is, I have a Patreon subscriber whose name is Bro Lifen. 
And he noticed in my trailer video number 18, which was my initial attempt at magnetic moments, uh, at about 19 minutes in, he looked at my spreadsheet and I have this fudge factor. And I, I said to the people in the video, I have this fudge factor in order to get the right answer. And I don't know where this fudge factor came from, yada, yada, yada. But Brolyphin recognized this as the inverse of the fine structure constant divided by 2. And that opened up everything. That just opened a Pandora, a Pandora's box. Um, and so let's go look at what happened in what I'm calling now the bro life and rabbit hole. Because of that, we can now unpack Planck's constant. It's no longer an arbitrary constant. We can unpack it for you and show you that it has amazing properties far beyond what the quantum grease monkeys thinks it means. And we can also unpack the fine structure constant. It's not really unitless. Let me tell you that right now. Okay, and this, like I said before, in the previous videos, in order for us to break the light barrier, we're going to have to drag the ether with us. We're going to have to drag the ether with us because we cannot move more than the speed of light relative to the ether. What we found at the bottom of the bro life and rabbit hole in the unpacking of the Planck constant was that matter, even though the pretons here that are spinning around circles are only moving relative to the ether in their locality at the speed of light, they're actually spinning up the ether. And because of that, they're moving at incredibly high speeds. Incredibly high speeds. In fact, you really want to know what the speed is? 5,000 times the speed of light. Okay, well, okay, that I'm an engineer, and that's really not good enough, because that means to cross the Milky Way galaxy, it's still going to take us 20 years. Okay, and I'm an engineer. I want it all. Okay, I want to be able to go to the opposite side of the galaxy, find some class M planet. I want to land on its surface. Okay, and I want to go out into my little spacesuit and I want to go find the nearest snowbank. And I want to leave my mark on the galaxy the way only a guy can. Okay, now let's get into some questions that were sent in by Patreon members. We had a Patreon member that said, why am I not accounting for the propagation delays of the fields when I'm computing the properties of the second order system of pretons? Very good question. Um, and I, I was going to get into that with my uh, Patreon folks last weekend, but I got, I got held up with other things. This here is a computer simulation of a so -so second order system of pretons. These little white circles are where pretons, if pretons would be an infinitesimal point at the center of these two circles. And these, these pretons are spinning around at the speed of light. And you'll notice in here, and I've scaled this up, the forces completely cancel in this little black hole in the center. So it doesn't matter where another preton exists. Okay, the forces are going to cancel. So I do not have to account for propagation delay, at least for yet. Now, this opens up a very, very, very interesting thing, that there has to be another force. And it might even be a very infinitesimally small force. And that is going to be the subject um, after we get past the new electromagnetism paper. Well, I mean, I'll be working on it. But right now, we need to get the new electromagnetism stuff out. Okay, but the interesting thing about this simulation is I can take it to trinary particles, and they're stable too. And I've gotten six-pointed particles, and I've changed how things flow in the middle to get more colors in there. But these are stable as well, and I've gone up to all kinds of particles. Now, this the electrogravity electricity paper is going to be released this weekend also. For my Patreon folks who have already seen it a month ago, I'm replacing the hand-drawn field models that were in the original version of the paper. I use them in that video as well. Now that we have the computer generated models, which are a little more accurate than the hand drawn models, I'm going to reshoot that part of the video to include the computer generated models. And these computer generated models are also being replaced in the version 1.1 of the paper. And I'm getting rid of these ones that were made using PowerPoint uh, objects. Okay, so version 1.1 of the paper is going to be released hopefully this weekend. I'm pretty sure I'm done with all the updates. Uh, there's a list of all the things that were changed. Uh, uh, the, the, all the stuff you've seen in this video are updates to this paper along with the new diagrams. 
Okay, finally, there's going to be another video released. Hopefully, it'll be done this weekend. Uh, if not, it'll certainly be done next weekend. And this will be for Patreon only. And what it's going to include is the new improved standard model applying all the Bro Life in rabbit hole improvements. Okay, in there we're going to show the, the unpacking of the plank and the fine structure constant and show you what they mean to, rel uh, to um, ethereal mechanics. Okay, then we're going to show you the derivation that shows you the 5000C FTL breakthrough. And that now that we have a particle that's dragging ether with it to achieve faster than light speed, the question becomes how do we do that with a starship? This is great, though. At least we can show something that is in the universe doing this. It means we should be able to do it, too, even though we may not, may not know how to do it yet. Okay, then we're going to show you the improved magnetic moments. And if you watched my previous video, quantum mechanics, their anomaly, their error, that is their error between what quantum mechanics predicts and what the measured value is. Okay, that's the error. Okay, the ethereal mechanics anomaly is this, and I actually have done a lot of simulation, and I know what the cause of this final anomaly is. I know how, I know the only thing you could possibly explain it. I just haven't found a way to be able to quantify it so I can cancel it out. Okay, but we'll get there. So I'm going to leave this uh, for the Patreon if they want to look at it and try to come up with how they can quantify that anomaly using what I believe is the reason for the anomaly. They're welcome to do that. And the other thing that's interesting, ethereal mechanics has no G factor. See, quantum mechanics has this G factor of two for these particles, but they don't really understand why the two has to be there. All they know is they got they need a factor of two to get the right answer. That's what I'm finding. Most of quantum mechanics is is somebody identified that their thing is close to these constants, and they say, "Oh yeah, it's got to be that." There's no real logic or reason as why things are in quantum mechanics. Uh, the, the quantum mechanics has become clown logic worse than relativity. I'm sorry. Like I said, the worst thing to happen to physics is physicists. In that video, we'll also explain how to read these diagrams, and I believe this particular tool is ready so we can give it to the source code to engineers above and the, the executable go to first class passengers and above so they can play around with it. Because I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm done putting stuff into this application. The application is called Pretonix. And in the standard model, we have all the predictions for the these uh, quarks and these leptons. And we have um, speculation on these guys here. So anyway, thank you. This is great. We're making progress toward getting humanity to the stars. Because now we can already see a case where something is dragging the ether with it to speed past the speed of light. So if you can help, please help. Go to my Patreon site, because if you want to stick around and keep watching those other guys that believe in relativity, where relativity says that gravity is not a force, but the relativistic models are certainly force models, and you want to sit there and listen to this clown logic of contradiction, you go right ahead, or you can come, become a Patreon member, and you're going to see things, because this standard model is not going to be released to the public for at least a year. Okay, so my Patreon members are going to see this this standard model is going to be for them only for at least the next year. Thank you very much. No more voodoo physics.